Hi everyone. Welcome to part three of the high yield GI review. This is going to be the last part of the series. So we hope you enjoy and hope you find it helpful. Let's get started. The first patient's going to have a high BMI with hepatomegaly. So this is hepatic steatosis, also called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Okay, so look out for patients who are obese and then have um, like a lot of adipocytes inside the liver. Okay, the next patient is going to have an AST ALT ratio of over two to one, hepatomegaly, and pink Mallory bodies. So this is alcoholic hepatitis, also caused alcoholic fatty liver disease. The next patient is going to have pruritus and anti-smooth muscle antibody present. So this is autoimmune hepatitis. So because this is an autoimmune condition, think of usually a middle-aged female. Um, it might be associated with other autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto hypothyroidism. So look out for that. Um, and again, the anti-smooth muscle antibody along with itching is going to be really important here. The next patient's going to be having hallucinations, trouble speaking, caser flesher rings in the eyes, flailing movements of upper extremities, tremors, and low ceruloplasmin. So this is Wilson's disease. The key thing here is these patients have a high copper level, and this gets deposited into different parts of the body. Um, mostly, remember the neurologic symptoms. You can get liver issues. You can get the eye, case or flesh or rings. And remember, high copper and low ceruloplasmin. The next patient is going to have bronze skin, a high glucose level, erectile dysfunction, and joint pain. So this is going to be hemochromatosis, okay, and this is due to an iron overload in the body, okay, so look out for the, we call it bronze diabetes, so, you know, tan skin, and then, you know, maybe newly diagnosed diabetes, and then some other symptoms like gonadal atrophy and joint pain. So that's hemochromatosis. The next patient's a newborn, jaundice, that gets better within two weeks and high indirect bilirubin. So this is physiologic neonatal jaundice. So this is due to decreased UDP glucuronal transferase levels, and that's why we get the high indirect bilirubin, okay? And it usually resolves within one to two weeks. The next patient's also a newborn, but this time they have persistent jaundice, dark urine, pale stool, a high direct bilirubin, and fibrosis of the bile ducts. So this is biliary atresia. Okay, the next patient is going to have shortness of breath, hepatomegaly, and PAS positive protein aggregates in the liver. So this is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. This one's going to be really high yield. Look out for the lung and the liver symptoms. Okay, so shortness of breath because of the lung issues and hepatomegaly because of the uh, protein aggregates in the liver. The next patient's going to have jaundice with stressor fasting and an elevated indirect bilirubin. So this is Gilbert syndrome. The next patient's a baby with jaundice, crinicterus, and an elevated indirect bilirubin. So this is gonna be krigler najjar syndrome. The next patient's gonna have an elevated direct bilirubin and dark pigments in the hepatocytes.
This is Dubin Johnson syndrome. I remember Dubin and Dark both start with a D, so that's how I remember this one. The next one has elevated direct bilirubin as well, but this time no dark pigments in the liver. So this is rotor syndrome. The next patient has a history of using oral contraceptives and has a central stellate scar on the liver. So this is focal nodular hyperplasia. The next patient also using oral contraceptives, but this time there's a solitary lesion in the liver. So this is a hepatic adenoma. The next patient has a history of arsenic or vinyl chloride exposure, and there's a CD31 positive mass in the liver. This is hepatic angiosarcoma. The next patient has confusion, flapping tremors with a high AST and ALT level. So this is gonna be hepatic encephalopathy. The next patient has a history of aflatoxin exposure from aspergillus with cirrhosis, weight loss, an elevated alpha fetoprotein. So this is hepatocellular carcinoma. So remember an elevated AFP is a tumor marker for this type of cancer. Um, and a lot of things can you know, cause it, for example, a history of Wilson's disease, uh, hepatitis, um, you know, fatty liver disease, alcoholic liver disease, aspergillus. So look out for, again, people with liver issues and then weight loss with a high AFP level. The next patient is going to have hematemesis, a distended abdomen with fluid, spider angiomas, and palmar erythema. So this is going to be cirrhosis. Okay, again, lots of different causes of getting cirrhosis, um, but the key things here, look out for the ascites, right, which is the distended abdomen, the hematemesis, usually because of the ruptured esophageal varices, um, and then there's something really high yield that they like to ask about is the high estrogen effect specifically that cirrhosis can cause, and high estrogen causes the spider angiomas, the palmar erythema, the gynecomastia, as well as gonadal atrophy. The next patient is going to be a really sick kid after aspirin use and they develop fatty liver and mitochondrial dysfunction. So this is Rye syndrome. Okay. And this is because usually they're going to mention a history of like a kid who gets a viral infection and then the parent gives them like an over-the-counter aspirin. And this puts them into this, you know, sudden liver failure. Okay. So this is going to be Rye syndrome. And remember, the only time you should give a child aspirin is in Kawasaki disease. The next patient's going to have a hepatic vein outflow tract obstruction a history of some kind of hypercoagulable state like cancer, polycythemia vera, and then they have hepatomegaly and congestion in the liver. So this is Bud Chiari syndrome, and this is often compared to the next patient who has an inflow tract obstruction with no hepatosplenomegaly. This is portal vein thrombosis. The next patient has right upper quadrant pain after a fatty meal and a stone in the cystic duct. So this is biliary colic. The next patient's going to have right upper quadrant pain, a fever, elevated white blood cells, and a positive Murphy sign when you push down on the right upper quadrant. They get inspiratory arrest. So this is cholecystitis, okay? So that's when you have usually 
of cholelithiasis or a gallstone and that gets inflamed. Now remember, you can also have acalculus cholecystitis where you don't have a stone, but usually you have a really sick patient, maybe in the ICU who suddenly gets these similar symptoms and we call that acalculus cholecystitis. The next patient's gonna have right upper quadrant pain, a fever, but now they also have jaundice, hypotension, and a stone is gonna be in the common bile duct. So this is cholangitis. Okay, so this is where now the stone has entered the common bile duct and we see more severe symptoms. So along with the right upper quadrant pain and fever, look out for other things like jaundice, hypotension, and altered mental status. The next patient is gonna have a calcified gallbladder and a history of multiple episodes of cholecystitis. So this is porcelain gallbladder. And this is really high yield because these patients are at really high risk of getting a gallbladder adenocarcinoma. So we have to do a cholecystectomy and remove the gallbladder to prevent these patients from getting gallbladder cancer. The next patient's gonna have a history of primary sclerosing cholangitis or a liver fluke like clonorchis infection, and they develop jaundice and weight loss. So this is a cholangiocarcinoma. Thank you so much for making it through all three of the high yield GI videos. We really hope you found them helpful. Please reach out if you have any questions and good luck studying. Thank you.